Uh, we're starting our discussions about uh, deformability of soils, uh, and we're going to start with the uh, case history. And the case history is the story about the Washington Monument. Let me turn off the lights. So Washington Monument in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, these are the credits where uh, we got the information. And uh, so George Washington was the first president of our country. Uh, he uh, was elected, uh, he was a general and uh, uh, got elected uh, in 1789. And he served two terms, two four-year terms, uh, until 1797, and he died in 1799. Uh, he was uh, uh, very well liked, and uh, uh, so when he died, people uh, decided that uh, they wanted to erect a structure in the memory of uh, George Washington. Uh, but it took them, you know, at the time, so s imagine uh, we're in the 1800, the mode of transportation is horses. And uh, typical structures to, uh, that were erected at that time uh, in the memory of somebody, uh, particularly a general, was somebody on a horse at the top of a column. Uh, and there were some, uh, some proposals like this, but the one that finally got selected 50 years later, so <laughs> construction uh, started only in uh, 1849 uh, when uh, money was uh, raised to the tune of about $200,000 at the time. Uh, the, the selected uh, structure was a very simple column, uh, obelisk type of column, uh, which in my mind because of its simplicity, has resisted the uh, test of time uh, through its uh, simple architecture and is still remarkably elegant uh, today. So, as I said here, uh, constructed in three, uh, three phases, started to in uh, 1848, first phase of construction, and 10 years later, the construction stopped because they ran out of money. And it actually turned out to be a good, uh, a good situation because there was a tremendous uh, problem associated with the, uh, uh, with the construction at that time, as we will see. Um, the uh, construction resumed, so that then there was the, the Civil War, uh, and then construction resumed after the Civil War in 1879. Uh, and started with uh, an underpinning, and I'll uh, mention that. And then the uh, third phase started uh, uh, was completion of the shaft, and the construction was completed in 1884. And, and the settlement of the structure was measured uh, starting in 1879. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, measurements of settlement starting at the beginning of construction, but we do have it during the second phase of construction. So let's see how uh, the whole thing started. So it began, as I mentioned, in 1848 uh, with uh, architect Robert Mills. And you can see here the beginning of the structure. The foundation at the time was a very simple pyramid, just uh, simply placed on the ground surface. And you can sense that uh, uh, this looks pretty heavy for the size of the foundation, particularly considering that the soil is in the vicinity of the Potomac River, uh, so therefore on relatively soft banks sediments. Uh, the original uh, foundation uh, was uh, uh, made of nice blocks. Uh, the shaft was made of uh, marble blocks, uh, very heavy. And the construction was halted when the, the height had reached about 55 meters. 
Uh, constru construction resumed in uh, 1879, so Robert Mills took care of the first part, and Lieutenant Colonel Casey, uh, with the Corps of Engineers, continued the, uh, took over the project in 1879. Uh, Casey looked at the foundation and uh, considered that the original foundation was uh, inadequate for the size of the column, and decided to underpin it. Underpinning means you go under the foundation piece by piece and you enlarge the foundation so that you actually decrease the pressure on the ground through this underpinning uh, process. Uh, and he was, uh, as you will see, it was a very good move because it, it actually reached a deeper soil and the monument was completed in 1884. So here's the cross section uh, of the, the monument. You can see, uh, so it was stopped right here. And if you go to Washington, D.C. today and you look carefully at the monument, you will see a difference in color between the bottom 55 meters and the top 100 meters of the column. And, and uh, Casey. Uh, who took over the project once uh, it was at this level, started by underpinning the foundation, and he completed the shaft using much thinner blocks of marble so that he wouldn't increase the weight of the structure dramatically. So here is, so it's a fairly sizable foundation. You can see here about 38 meters, 120 feet, and the original foundation is in brown, and piece by piece, KC uh, and his engineers and the construction workers were under the foundation to increase the size of the foundation by placing those uh, pink blocks here that enlarge the foundation from an original 13 meters to more than, uh, to about triple the size of 38 meters. And we'll see what that did to the, uh, to the pressures. So looking at the load versus time, uh, so we're back here in 1848 when uh, Robert Mills, the architect, starts to uh, construct that uh, Washington Monument. And then construction over the next 10 years takes place, the load increases, and when Mills finishes and runs out of money, he's at about 300 meganewton of load on that foundation. I will show you uh, afterwards that under this 300 meganewton, uh, the actual settlement, the settlement we calculated was of the order of 1.2 meters. Uh, so very significant settlement. Uh, and, and I know even when I look at this very large settlement, every time I go to Washington DC, I, I take the time to stare at the Washington Monument and see if I can detect any kind of leaning of that monument. And to this day, I have not been able to, so it's a remarkable story in the sense that unlike Pisa, uh, this foundation went straight down uh, and, and, uh, and we never ended with the uh, Leaning Monument of Washington. So at that point in time, uh, the, they ran out of money and then civil war around here. And then uh, in uh, 78, uh, construction resumes and the underpinning itself is increasing the weight of the structure. So at the same time that uh, Casey was trying to uh, decrease the pressure, he was actually increasing the load and you can see that the larger foundation increased the load from 300 to about 450 meganewton. And then he started to finish the column, and the column finished at about 600 meganewton of load in uh, 1885 or so. When you look at the, uh, so th these are some of the numbers. You can see here that the, the weight of the original foundation, 70 meganewton, led to 118 kPa of pressure. The weight at the end of phase one is 300 meganewton, or 500 kilopascal of pressure. That's, by the way, about the same pressure as the pressure under the Tower of Pisa. Uh, the weight of the new foundation was 150, so the increase was significant. 
uh, even though the purpose was to decrease the pressure, it definitely decreased the rope. The final weight of the Washington Monument, 600 meganewton, and the pressure, 465. So KC was very bright in the sense that he was able to decrease the pressure from 513 to 465 while completing the monument. By, by comparison, uh, the San Jacinto Monument is 300 mega Newton, Tower of Pisa 140, Eiffel Tower 94. Of course, the Eiffel Tower is 300 meters. It's the tallest of these of all these monuments, but it's full of holes, and that's why it's not uh, as heavy. So here is the pressure. The story about the pressure is remarkably interesting because. Uh, again, beginning of the construction, a small foundation, large load, the pressure in uh, 1858, when the first phase is completed, is around 500 kilopascal. And then it stays there through the civil war. And then Mills comes in and he enlarges the foundation that increases the load, but it decreases the pressure. And by decreasing the pressure significantly, he is able to complete the, uh, the construction of the column and uh, um, uh, finishing the total pressure here um, at, at a pressure less than the, the pressure under the, the first phase. So it's, uh, and there's been a lot of, of uh, borings, uh, soil borings done around the monument, you see the monument column here, and then the foundation in print, and then a number of, uh, of uh, borings done. Uh, here is a cross-section of the soil uh, layers. Uh, and you can see that here you have the fill and the clay, the alluvions from the, uh, the river. And that original foundation was in this uh, pink layer here, which which is quite soft. The underpinning allowed uh, KC to get down to this sand and gravel layer that is much, much stronger. Now, I'm not sure if KC knew that that sand layer was there, uh, but he certainly uh, made a good move by putting it down into this uh, green layer, this sand and gravel layer. So here are some of the soil properties. Uh, on the left is the water content, on the right the plasticity index, uh, nothing very special. Uh, this is the pre-consolidation pressure. Uh, we'll see that uh, later when we discuss uh, the, uh, uh, this is the compression index when we talk about the consolidation test. Uh, but this may be the, uh, oh, oh no, this is the uh, uh, recompression index, again, we'll talk about this co coefficient of consolidation, uh, but this is the one that uh, may be quite useful. The broke out from the standard penetration test, you can see how that original foundation was in relatively soft material, very low broke out, but then the sand layer has a broke out that reaches about 100, which is quite dense and quite high, and that's why the monument doesn't have any settlement problem. Uh, during the, the second phase, as we will see in a minute. So we can do the calculations of bearing capacity, and uh, we, we saw a little bit of that at the end of uh, shear strength, and if you do that calculations, you can, uh, uh, you, you know, I, we saw that the ultimate pressure was about six times the undrained shear strength. When you do this, you find that the ultimate pressure under the monument uh, that the soil can take is around 500. I also told you that the pressure at the end of phase one was about 500. So that's why there was a significant amount of settlement during phase one and that uh, without the underpinning, the monument probably would have collapsed uh, before the end of, uh, of construction. Uh, when it comes to uh, settlement, we have to calculate the stress and we can calculate the stress at the end of phase one under that initial foundation. You see about 500 here under the foundation and it decreases with depth. And then we can do it again after the underpinning. And you can see that the pressure after underpinning uh, has decreased significantly. 
we can use those pressures and uh, consolidation test. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, uh, later. And then here is the, uh, the reconstituted settlement. Uh, this is settlement in meters. So you see about one meter right here, three feet. And then this is time because the settlement of the Washington Monument has been measured uh, over the years ever since the, the second phase right here in uh, 1878. Um, and, and, but you see that during the first phase, so this is, a, this is the values that I calculated, that the, the students and I calculated. And so you, you're around 1.3 meters. That's a significant amount of settlement. And it's remarkable, as I say, that the settlement, the, the structure went down very straight. So that uh, even the second phase, and then that's the additional settlement uh, during the second phase. So minimal settlement, uh, and this is the little blue piece here is during underpinning. So even though KC was trying to minimize settlement, when he was doing this underpinning, the monument was continuing to go down. So he must have uh, spent some some uh, stressful nights uh, when he was doing that uh, the structure. And ever since that time, the monument keeps going down, but very slowly, and there's no, no, uh, no issue with it. So let me, I believe this is the last one, yeah. Let me go ahead and put the lights on, and we can move on with the topic. So the, the topic, this was a case history about uh, soil compression, soil deformation. And the topic of the lecture today is uh, it's the first lecture, the first of four lectures on uh, soil uh, deformation. So, soil deformation. The last four lectures were on shear strength. Uh, this one is on soil deformation. So when you think about the uh, a stress strain curve uh, in a five plot, the stress strain curve might look something like this. During the last four lectures, we talked about what was happening here and how we could actually. Uh, evaluate the shear strength of soils. What we're going to discuss now, and typically with a structure, we'll consider this value, we'll put a factor of safety that brings the stress down to a working load level. And, and what we're about to discuss here is going to be related to what's happening early on at much smaller strain. Because again, typically in foundation, we're going to have to worry about making sure that the, the, the foundation is safe. And then we're going to have to make sure that at working roads, the displacement, the settlement, is limited to an acceptable value. Uh, if you think of the Washington Monument, you have a big column like this, and you have a, a And you start zooming in under the monument at a random point F. And then I zoom in at M and I look at what's happening at F. I want to have a set of axes. I'm going to take Z in that direction, X in that direction, and Y in that direction. Okay? So that I can get oriented. At M, I can draw a cube. This is an infinitely small cube. That's why I got to zoom in to be able to see it. But this cube is going to have uh, a number of faces. And on those faces will exist stresses. 
there will be on each face, there will be a stress perpendicular to the face, there will be a stress along a certain direction, a shear stress, so this is the normal stress, and there will be another stress. And, I, and those three components, the two shears and the normal stress, will exist on each one of those faces. So first of all, uh, we're going to uh, define what we talk about when uh, we say, for example, sigma xy. So sigma xy is going to be a stress perpendicular uh, sorry, it's going to be a stress on a plane stress on plane perpendicular to x in the direction of y. So stress on a plane perpendicular to x in the direction of y. So for example, this green stress right here is on a plane perpendicular to z in the direction of z. So this one is sigma z z. Uh, if I now want to, let's see, which one did I pick? I said, uh, well, I said sigma xy here. So let's find sigma xy. So sigma xy is going to be on a plane perpendicular to x. So where is x? x is like this. So this is the plane perpendicular, perpendicular, perpendicular to x in the direction of y. Okay, so this is going to be sigma x1. And because it's a shear, we typically use tau in geotechnical engineering instead of, of uh, sigma. So that's uh, the definition that uh, we will use. Uh, and again, you'll have normal stresses and shear stresses on each one of those planes. When it comes to strains, we will have the same type of definition. And if I take a, uh, uh, this plane right here, then, and I've, I've got a stress applied to that plane, and that would be sigma zz here. And associated with that normal strain stress, I would have a deformed shape that would create a normal strain in this direction and a normal strain in that direction. Uh, this might be uh, delta H and the initial height, height of that phase might be h, and so epsilon zz would be simply, in this case, delta h over h. Uh, if I had uh, that same face and I were to consider deformation in shear, then I would generate a shear strain. Here is the shear. And the shear strain would be generated in the, this fashion. And if this was delta y, let's say, and this was again h, then the shear strain would be equal to delta y over h, okay, in small strain uh, definition. Okay, so this is definition of strains, this is definition of stresses. With those definitions, we can use uh, 
the uh, theory of elasticity to relate the stresses and the strains through two parameters called the, the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. So basically what we do is we say close to the origin here we can, we can uh, put a straight line and we can say that within that zone the soil behaves in a linear fashion. Now, a lot of people might say, well, no, but soils are not elastic, and therefore you should not use a modulus of elasticity uh, because soils are uh, not elastic. Well, that's true, soils are not elastic, meaning that if you load them and then you take the load off, they're not going to rebound to where they used to be because there is significant amount of plastic deformations associated with the deformation. But that doesn't mean that you cannot assume that the loading stress-strain curve can be reasonably approximated by a straight line. Uh, the big problem is that we have a nonlinear behavior of the material, unlike uh, concrete and, and, and steel, uh, where the approximation is, is much better. Uh, and that means that the modulus of soil is quite complex and depends on a lot of things. Uh, but but uh, making an approximation that says that uh, this deformation characteristic of the soil at relatively small strain can be approximated, approximated by a straight line is very reasonable and is used extensively in geotechnical engineering. All right. Having said this, accepting the limitations of the theory of elasticity, uh, the theory is based on a number of equations that link the stresses and the strengths. And we're going to uh, write those. And so we'll write that epsilon xx equals 1 over e sigma xx minus nu sigma yy plus sigma zz. Okay. And then epsilon yy equals 1 over e sigma yy minus nu sigma xx plus sigma zz. And then epsilon zz equals 1 over e sigma zz minus nu sigma xx plus sigma yy. Okay, by permutations. That takes care of the relationship between the normal strains and the normal stresses. When it comes to the uh, shear strains, we write that gamma is equal, gamma xy is equal to tau xy divided by g. That gamma yz is equal to tau yz divided by g, and that gamma zx is equal to tau zx divided by g. Okay. It turns out that, uh, uh, well, before I get to that, note that when you apply a load in the vertical direction and the material squeezes, the amount of deformation that you get in this direction depends on the stresses existing in the other two directions. You see that epsilon xx is certainly related to sigma xx, but also related to sigma yy and sigma zz. So the confinement effect is important because it will have an influence of epsilon xx, epsilon yy, and epsilon zz. But that's not the case for the shear strain. In other words, the shear strain, what happens in this direction, the shear strain is related to the shear stress in that direction and not what happens in the other two directions. Okay, so that's the distinction that, uh, between the normal strains and the, and the, uh, and the shear strains. Now, uh, in here, nu 
is the Poisson's ratio. Uh, e is Young's modulus. And uh, G is the shear modulus. So shear is a model, and uh, uh, both uh, Poisson and Young were uh, uh, engineers and mathematicians that uh, developed these source of equation and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the parameter uh, got their name in the final analysis. When it comes to, uh, so first of all, uh, G is related to the other two variables through this equation. All right, we're not going to go through this, but uh, G is related. So these equations really have two uh, parameters, two important parameters, the Poisson's ratio and the Young's modulus. And we measure uh, the, the modulus, and, and uh, while uh, Young was uh, in soils, I prefer to call this a modulus of deformation, because there's a tendency to, uh, but it's a minor, minor thing, but uh, modulus of deformation. What are the what are some, some typical values of these uh, two parameters? Well, uh, the Poisson ratio, we don't often measure it. And uh, we tend to uh, consider two extreme situations, if you wish, the drain case, and in the drain case, we typically use values of 0.3 to 0.35 for a Poisson's ratio, 0.3 to 0.35. When it comes to the modulus, this is uh, all, you know, it's a discussion. In fact, uh, the next uh, lecture will be uh, uh, concentrating on the, on the soil modulus, how do we choose it, what are the influencing factors, and so on. Uh, so it's really uh, very variable, I'll put this, very variable. Depends on many, depends on many factors. And we will discuss this. But overall, for most geotechnical problems, if you need a range, I would say that uh, the modulus for foundations, uh, uh, slope deformations, uh, 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 retaining walls, uh, the range of these, uh, uh, this this uh, modulus is probably from one megapascal to about 100 megapascal. <coughs> if you have a, a soil with a 100 megapascal modulus, it's pretty hard, uh, pretty stiff. Uh, if, uh, if you have one megapascal, you probably can put your thumb through it. Uh, it deforms uh, quite a bit. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss, we'll come back to, to this uh, uh, later on. Now, by comparison, by the way, uh, so this is for soils. Uh, if you look at uh, steel, for example, uh, you're looking at 200,000 megapascal. And if you look at concrete, you're talking about something like 20,000 megapascal. So if you were to draw a uh, stress-strain curve of unconfined compression test, you know, uh, sigma versus epsilon, then you would have uh, steel.
seal right here. You would have concrete 110 of this. So concrete would be right here maybe. And then you would have soil right there. I mean you could hardly see that the soil would actually take off on the on the uh, stress uh, scale. So and that's what makes uh, makes it tough in geotechnical engineering because we have those very heavy structures and we have to build that on, on soup, on mayonnaise, on, on, on materials that are extremely soft <coughs> compared to the other materials that we're using on top of it. So keep that in mind. Soil are quite deformable. They're quite variable. Uh, and so that makes, uh, that makes our business uh, quite difficult. All right, let me say this. Let me... Uh, do a few problems that will exemplify how we actually uh, calculate the, um, the the modulus. So the first one is to look at uh, to look at a triaxial test um, and the triaxial test you remember has Sigma one this way. Well, we'll put it in in uh, effective stresses, and then sigma prime three. And uh, these are the. By the way, you need to learn those equations. You need to know those equations. Uh, they are very likely to be on the final. You need to uh, maybe you you need to learn one, and then the others are by permutation. You need to learn this one, and then the others are by permutation but very likely uh, a question on the final. So let's apply this, uh, these equations to the situation of the triaxial test. And uh, we're, so uh, instead of x and y and z, we have one, two, and three because these are principal stresses. So I'm gonna write that epsilon one in the one in the uh, axial direction uh, is going to be 1 over e sigma prime 1 minus nu sigma prime 2 which is also sigma prime 3 because remember in the triaxial test uh, the confining pressure is all around so I've got sigma prime 3 here and another sigma prime 3 here so in other words and I do measure in the uh, typically in the triaxial test, you know, the soil will deform in something like this. And I do measure the settlement, the delta L, which I compare to the initial length, and then I get epsilon one equals delta L over F. So I do measure that when uh, <coughs> when I get the uh, the results of the triaxial test. But you see here that E is going to be equal to sigma prime one minus two nu sigma prime three divided by epsilon one. So if I plot, if I plot as, as a result of the triaxial test sigma prime one versus epsilon one, and I say, all right, here is the stress strain curve that I get from this test. I say, all right, here is uh, a relatively straight part of the triaxial uh, stress strain curve. And I'm going to calculate the slope of that line. And that's the slope of the line. The slope of that line is not the modulus. Okay, so remember that the slope of that line is not the modulus. I'll write it. Uh, the slope of that line is not the modulus.
Instead, to calculate the modulus, I need to do sigma prime 1 minus 2 nu sigma prime 3 over epsilon 1. There is one exception to that statement, and that's when sigma prime 3 is 0. Because when sigma prime 3 is 0, then E is sigma prime 1 over epsilon 1, and then it's the slope of the line. So not monitors unless the test is an unconfined compression test. Unconfined compression test. So if you do, uh, you know, crushing of, of uh, concrete cylinders, uh, then that's okay to take the slope of the line as uh, the modulus of the material. But in, in soils, we don't often do that because if we don't put confinement, then there's very little strength or stiffness that we get the other way. So we often put the sigma 3, if nothing else, to try to recreate the stress level that exists in the soil around the sample before we took it out of there. So we try to recreate the confinement that exists in, uh, in the soil before we load it vertical, vertically. So therefore, so that's, uh, and that's again a very important equation and that could very well be one of the short questions on, on the uh, final. By the same token, uh, where can I go? Maybe here. By the same token, uh, if I do the Poisson's ratio, the Poisson's ratio, uh, you might have seen very often that, so you've got a strain in this direction, and you've got a strain in that direction. And the idea is that the Poisson's ratio is equal to minus epsilon 3 divided by epsilon 1. Okay? That's wrong. I mean, that's definitely not the general case. So let's put a big X on this and see why. Well, if this is, uh, so let, let, me, uh, let me write it out. Okay? It will take a minute to do that. Epsilon 3 is equal to 1 over E, sigma 3 minus nu sigma 1 plus sigma 3, because sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3. And epsilon 1 is equal to 1 over E, sigma 1 minus nu uh, sigma 3 plus sigma 3. Okay? If I form the ratio of those two things, epsilon 3, over epsilon 1, I don't get nu. I get sigma 3. Whoops. I get, so the E will cancel. And I get sigma 3 minus nu sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by sigma 1 minus nu sigma 3 plus sigma 3, or 2 sigma 3. Okay? So this is not equal to nu. There's one case where it's equal to nu, and uh, that is the case. So in fact, when you do the, uh, the calculations, and I have it here, let me see if I can uh, put it on the board. The, the expression for nu is actually nu equal minus epsilon 3 sigma 1. plus epsilon 1 sigma 3 divided by epsilon 1 sigma 1 plus epsilon 1 sigma 3 plus epsilon 1 sigma 3 and one more term minus 2 epsilon 3 sigma 3. 
So I'm not going to ask you to remember that one. But do remember the modulus uh, one. Okay. So this is the right expression for the Poisson's ratio given a, a Traxel test uh, rolling. Again, uh, the Poisson's ratio is not equal to this. Uh, maybe I should, uh, I, I should not. So Poisson's ratio equals minus epsilon 3 over epsilon 1 only if sigma 3 is equal to 0. You see that if sigma 3 is equal to 0, all this disappears, sigma 1 cancel, and I get to minus epsilon 3 over epsilon 1. And so only if sigma 3 equals 0. All right, so that's another important uh, thing. And so if you do unconfined compression testing, then uh, you can uh, use this uh, equation right here. But if in the general case of a triaxial test, you cannot do that, and you have to use this total equation, unfortunately, and that's one of the reasons why I say we rarely measure it, in triaxial testing, we rarely measure epsilon 3. We always measure sigma 1, sigma 3, epsilon 1, but rarely epsilon 3. It's difficult. It's becoming easier as we now have uh, image analysis of sample deformation. Uh, but before that, we were placing some uh, uh, deformation gauges uh, horizontally around the, the, uh, the cylinder, uh, but it's, uh, it's not, it was not that easy, so we, we didn't used to, uh, to do that. Uh, uh, one last thing, uh, I just want to do an example, uh, so let's see, I'm looking at problem 14.1, problem 14.1, page 429. Let me go there. 429. Okay, I'm there. So it says, consider the stress strain curve for a Traxel test shown in figure 14.1s. Right, let me try to reproduce this so we can look at the same thing. So I've got a stress strain curve right here, and uh, the axes are. Uh, 50, 100, and 150, so 50, 100, 150, 150, 0, and that is sigma prime 1, so this is sigma prime 1 in KPA, and on the horizontal axis I've got the strain epsilon z in uh, in strain units, so therefore no units. All right, then I have 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 and so on. And then I've got a stress strain curve, and that stress strain curve goes straight, it's a simplification, to this point, and then it fails uh, like this. I also measure, and this is a special transal test, I also measure both epsilon z, so same axis here, epsilon z, and epsilon r. So right here I have epsilon z and epsilon r. And the units are, so 0.01, the, the same thing here, 0.01, 0.02, 0.03, 0.04, 0.01, 0.02, 0.03, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.04, 0.
Why is epsilon r negative? Because this is negative. Okay, this is minus, minus. Why is epsilon r negative when epsilon z is positive? The reason is that epsilon z is compression, whereas epsilon r is tension and extension. And uh, that, so that's uh, the reason why. And that's why you see a minus sign on this ratio here, okay? Uh, because epsilon r is negative when epsilon z is positive. Calculate Poisson's ratio. So you can, you have, so we'll do it for uh, this point here. Okay, we'll consider point A, and this is point A. So you can see that you have epsilon z, which is epsilon 1, you have epsilon r, which is epsilon 3. The values, you have sigma prime 1, and uh, the sigma prime 3 is missing. I forgot to tell you, sigma prime 3 is 40 kPa. Sigma prime 3 equals 40 kPa. So you have all the elements to calculate the Poisson's ratio. And I found, when I did that, I got uh, 0.47, okay? So Poisson ratio, according to the equation, I got 0.47. So it sounds like an undrained test, or close to undrained test. Calculate the sum modulus between O and A. O is right here, A is there. So again, you go to that equation, E equal sigma prime 1, 100, minus 2, New, we just got it, 0.47, sigma prime 3, 40, divided by epsilon 1, 0. Okay, and then when I did this, I got 62.40. So 62.40 kPa. There's no units to Poisson's ratio, but modulus is in the units of stress. Calculate the ratio between the soil modulus and the modulus of concrete. So then uh, I took 20,000 uh, megapascal and I found E concrete divided by E soil equal, what did I get? 3205. So this is a, a first uh, lecture on the uh, modulus of soils. Uh, next time we will talk about all the factors that influence the soil and how we can best evaluate a soil modulus for a given uh, case in geotechnical engineering.